sesiones, eh, hay el servicio de traducción para quienes lo requieran. Eh, la segunda audiencia de esta mañana está referida al tema de medidas para prevenir las violaciones de derechos humanos eh, por las industrias extractivas canadienses eh, que desarrollan actividades en América Latina. Eh, afuera en la mesa también hay algunas copias eh, disponibles de nuestro informe de la comisión eh, que en resumen se conoce como industrias extractivas, por si alguien no lo tiene y le interesa. Está también en la página web de la comisión, eh, entiendo que en español, inglés y en portugués. Bien, esta audiencia ha sido solicitada de parte de la sociedad civil por la Do, eh, Due Process of Law Foundation, por el, el Centro de, de Derechos Humanos, de, el Centro de Investigaciones en Derechos Humanos de la Universidad de Ottawa y también por eh, The Justice eh, and Accountability Project. Eh, en esta audiencia cada una de las partes tendrá una primera intervención de hasta 15 minutos. Con estos carteles indicaré cuando falte el 5, 3 y 1. Me acompañan eh, en la mesa el comisionado James Cavallaro, que es relator para Canadá, la comisionada Esmeralda Rosemena de Troitiño, que es relatora para la niñez, el comisionado Luis Ernesto Vargas, que es comisionado para personas migrantes y en mi caso soy Francisco de Guren, presidente de la comisión y relator para derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Eh, agradeceré que al momento de hacer uso de la palabra, eh, cada uno de los miembros de la delegación que intervengan se identifiquen para efecto de la grabación o que la persona que encabeza la delegación presente al resto de sus integrantes. Sin más, vamos a empezar entonces con la presentación de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil hasta por 15 minutos. Adelante, por favor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Inter-American Commission. A special, special acknowledgement to uh, Mr. Cavallaro. It has me a pleasure to count on you and hope the best luck for you in the next steps. Uh, for the past four years, the Commission has held several hearings in which it addressed the responsibility of the Canadian state regarding the support given to mining companies involved in serious human rights violations in Latin America and worldwide. In its report, the impacts of extractive activities on indigenous peoples and Afro-descendant rights, the Commission highlighted several examples of how Canada's policies and legal framework generate a pattern of corporate impunity for the benefit of its companies and for the prejudice of their victims. In the next 15 minutes, we will demonstrate that despite the several statements and recommendations made by the Commission, there have been no substantial changes in the policies, practices and legal framework in Canada. Petitioners will make its presentation in the following order. The Human Rights Clinic of the University of Ottawa, Maritimes Guatemala Breaking the Silence Network, the Justice Incorporate Accountability Project, and Oxfam Canada. Good morning. My name is Salvador Herencia Carrasco, and I'm with the Human Rights Clinic of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. We were last year, in March 2015, when Canadian and Latin American organizations called for the need to implement concrete regulations to prevent and to remedy abuses perpetrated by corporations registered in Canada. Since then, these issues have been addressed by different UN committees and especially the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, restating this as a pressing concern. For example, the UN Committee on the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights recommended in 2016 that Canada should, one, is strengthen its legislation governing the conduct of corporations registered or domiciled in Canada, two, require private corporations to conduct human rights impact assessments prior to making investment decisions, three, introduce effective mechanisms to investigate complaints file against those corporations, and four, adopt legislative measures necessary to facilitate access to justice before Canadian courts. These recommendations are in line with the demands of our organizations. Despite the evidence of harm or threat of harm on vulnerable populations in Latin America originated by Canadian mining companies, there is still no legal and policy changes in Canada on this field. An issue of special concern is the financing of mining ventures by public entities like Export and Development Canada, EDC. 
For years, EDC has been a strong supporter of extractive ventures in Latin America, providing millions of dollars in project financing. Just this year, EDC has financed 14 extractive projects in Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, with a value range of approximately 580 to 1.1 billion US dollars. The purpose is not to deny the importance of financial support by these institutions. The problem is that there are grounds to believe that these resources are provided without meaningful social and environmental assessments, and there are no clear mechanisms to prevent that these are used in context where human rights could be violated. This lack of proper checks and balances, transparency, and accountability can foster serious human rights violations. For example, there are reports about, this, about the situations in the Puerto Gaitan oil fields in Colombia. Despite serious allegations of labor exploitation, lack of consultation on indigenous peoples, and crimes of sexual violence happening in Puerto Gaitan, EDC is still granted an additional 250 to 500 million dollars in May 2016 to Ecopetrol and its Canadian partners. This shows that there is no clarity regarding the criteria or assessment before EDC financially supports these projects. Although this is a crown corporation or public entity, and they, they state that there is a due diligence requirement to assure that these projects are socially responsible, there is no access of information on these reports. The title of this hearing is Measures to Prevent Human Rights Violations by Canadian Extractive Industries that Operate in Latin America. We will next hear reports of people whose lives were shattered because of mining projects that did not fulfill minimum human rights standards. Canada has a home state obligation to prevent this from recurring. It should start with granting full access to information regarding the financing of mining projects by public entities. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Lisa Rankin, and I'm the Guatemala coordinator for the Maritimes Guatemala Breaking the Silence Network, based in Tatamagosh, Nova Scotia, Canada. We have been working in Guatemala for 25 years, and since 2004, working with communities in resistance to Canadian mining companies. We are a grassroots solidarity network, and I have worked and lived in Guatemala for the past eight years. Since the early 1990s, Breaking the Silence has accompanied individuals and organizations in Guatemala acting as international observers and witnesses to human rights violations. This work can help dissuade violence and help Guatemalan human rights defenders work more safely. Our work is directed by our partners. On a local level, we spend time with community members and learn about their experiences and struggles. This means staying at people's homes, attending hearings, community referendums, wakes and funerals of human rights defenders that have been killed, and we go with the family to demand an investigation into their deaths. My job is to make sure community members know that they are not alone, and that there are people outside their community that care what's happening to them. On April 15, 2014, I attended the wake and funeral of Topacio Reynoso Pacheco. She was a 16-year-old human rights activist and artist, well known for her community, in her community for her vocal opposition to the Escobar Mine, which is a Canadian company owned by Tahoe Resources. The project is located in the town of San Rafael Las Flores, only six kilometers away. Topacio had formed a youth group to speak about the consequences of the project so close to her home, as the region is primarily agricultural. There was and continues to be deep concern of the effects of this silver mine on water quality and quantity, which has strongly affected the local economy. Topacio and her family were involved in supporting some of the 16 community referendums that were held in the area where tens and thousands of Xinka indigenous and non-indigenous people rejected mining in the region. Topacio Reynoso was shot on April 13, 2014, when traveling with her father. She died the following morning due to her injuries. Her father, Alex Reynoso, was in a coma nine days but survived. Topacio's mother was three months pregnant. I have had the great privilege of getting to know the Reynoso Pacheco family over the past four years, which includes a second attempt against her father's life. This is a clear example of the attempts to silence voices of opposition to this project. Tobasi is one of seven people who have been killed in connection to this mine. Right now, there is a peaceful protest in the community of Casilla Santa Rosa, which is blocking mine-related traffic to the project, having suspended operations through direct action since early June. Since 2013, my Guatemalan and Canadian colleagues and I have brought these concerns to the Canadian Embassy to alert them about the grave human rights violations which have occurred around the Escobar mine. 
We have shared urgent actions, press releases, interviews, letters of concern, and brought our Guatemalan partners to meet with embassy officials. It is important to point out the Canadian Embassy has demonstrated public support for this project. On April 29, 2013, two days after the shooting at the mine site against peaceful protesters, which is now being brought again in Canada, Canadian Ambassador Hugh Russo participated as a witness of honour in the signing of a pact between the Guatemalan government and Tahoe Resources to voluntarily raise royalty payments from 1 to 5 percent. At this point, 12 community referendums had already taken place, and just three days later, a state of emergency was declared to quell opposition in the region. Now, with mine operations suspended, there is growing concern of more criminalization of violence and over Tahoe Resources lobbying of the Canadian government. The CEO of Tahoe Resources has said publicly that is working to quote unquote pick apart the community resistance. From lobbying records, we know Tahoe Resources has been meeting with the Canadian government in Ottawa. Community members fear criminalization, another state of emergency, or more assassinations. Breaking the silence is profoundly concerned and indignant about the grave human rights violations that Canadian companies are committing that are known to the Canadian government. As Topaz at Topacio's funeral, her mother said, the resistance doesn't end here, my love. We will continue to support the legitimate and peaceful resistance to the local population at the Escobar mine and Canadian company Tahoe Resources in defense of their water, agricultural lands, and way of life. Canada has a responsibility to recognize their role in the conflict plaguing this region affected by the Escobar mine and the negative effects Canadian companies like Tahoe Resources have on communities. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Leah Gardner and I'd like to speak uh, briefly about a report that was published in 2016 by the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project, JCAP, called The Canada Brand Violence and Canadian Mining Companies in Latin America. I should mention that I'm speaking on behalf of JCAP today and not my employer. JCAP is a volunteer-driven legal clinic based at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. We support communities aff affected by the extractive industry and our partners are primarily in Latin America. Canada Brand Report compiles and analyzes publicly available reporting on violence associated with Canadian mining in Latin America from 2000 to 2015. Uh, before uh, publishing the report, we contact the mining companies mentioned in it. Uh, ten of them got back to us and uh, we made some changes based on their comments. From 2000 to 2015, we found 34 violent conflicts involving 28 different Canadian mining companies, both small and large, in 13 different countries. We found reports of 44 deaths, four disappearances, uh, 30 of those deaths appear to have been targeted killings. This includes the case of Topacio Reynoso. We found 403 physical injuries ranging from minor to permanent disability. 709 instances of criminalization, including legal complaints, arrests, detention, detentions, and charges laid against individuals opposed to Canadian mining projects. So it's hard to get a sense of what those numbers mean without talking about the stories and the people behind them. Uh, so I'll just mention a few examples of the reporting uh, on uh, mining and women. In Guatemala in 2007, 11 indigenous women were allegedly gang raped by soldiers and mine security guards during an eviction to clear the way for a Canadian mining project. The company states that the evictions were peaceful and that this did not occur. In Nicaragua in 2015, police blockaded a town of protesting mine workers and raided homes. When workers fled to the mountains, village women continued the demonstration, demanding the release of their husbands and sons and respect for labor rights. In El Salvador in 2009, an outspoken opponent of a Canadian mining project was shot to death on her way back uh, from doing laundry at a nearby river. She was eight months pregnant at the time and carrying her two-year-old daughter in her arms when she was killed. We couldn't come to any conclusions on whether there was any wrongdoing by any company because the study is based entirely on written reports available online. Uh, we didn't have the budget to carry out in-depth on-the-ground investigations, which we believe could very well reveal more violence, especially in Mexico. While our study focuses on violent conflict, we recognize that the impacts of mining are wide-ranging. For example, rural, rural communities also report 
death threats, environmental destruction, land dispossession, the impact on farming, and the militarization of, of rural communities. So I think it's best to think of our report as a snapshot of some of the worst expressions of conflict, but not necessarily uh, representative of the actual extent of the impact that extractive projects can have on people's lives. To conclude, a uh, violent conflict associated with Canadian mining appears to be common throughout Latin America. We found a significant number of recent cases across the continent that merit independent investigation and action by the Canadian government. A small step forward would be for Canada to create an independent ombudsperson's office uh, with strong powers to investigate the cases like the ones in our report. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Ian Thompson, and I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Oxfam Canada today. We strongly support Canada's stated commitment to promote human rights and to pursue a foreign policy that is proudly feminist. However, we believe that establishing effective corporate accountability mechanisms is essential to achieving those objectives. As a global leader in mining investment, Canada has a responsibility to ensure that resource extraction does not result in increased gender-based violence and that the unique perspectives of women and girls are taken into account when resource extraction is being considered. An independent ombudsperson with robust powers to investigate allegations of human rights violations is urgently needed for Canada to fulfill its duty to protect human rights. In cases where minimum standards have been breached, the office must have the power to recommend the withdrawal of public financing and other forms of Canadian government support. In addition to an ombudsperson office, Canada must take the following six actions. Remove legal barriers to facilitate access to Canadian courts for those who have been harmed by the international operations of Canadian companies. Require all companies to conduct mandatory human rights due diligence, and that includes parent companies' due diligence over their subsidiaries. Three, adopt law reforms mandating that the Government of Canada, including its embassies and credit, export credit agency, apply human rights due diligence and gender impact assessments uh, uh, in all government procurement and trade advocacy. On behalf of all who appeared here today, I'd like to thank the Commission for carefully considering Canada's significant role in the extractive industries. Your findings and recommendations can guide Canada's promotion of human rights in the hemisphere. Thank you. Puede terminar las four, five, six. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair. It's always good to have a little anticipation. Um, uh, number four, uh, to strengthen Canada's guidelines for diplomats on supporting human rights defenders engaged around land and environmental rights in the context of resource extraction and to make them legally binding. Five, to conduct a thorough review of Canada's corporate social responsibility strategy from a gender perspective and implement the strategy through a feminist lens. Finally, six, to develop a national action plan on business and human rights and to make it the most gender responsive of its kind in the world. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, de la intervención del Estado, por favor, está por 15 minutos. Good morning, once again, Commissioners, and uh, let me begin, first of all, by thanking the petitioners for bringing this issue forward. Um, it's very important. I want to also thank them for putting their voices out there and for continuing to draw attention to this situation in Latin America and around the world. It's challenging work, and I thank them and congratulate them for being willing to do it. I welcome this opportunity to speak before the Commission uh, on our efforts to encourage and advance responsible business conduct and respect for human rights in business operations abroad, particularly with Canadian mining exploration companies. My remarks are largely structured around the key themes that have been identified by the petitioners in this hearing. But before addressing those specific issues, I would like to place these issues in a broader context of Canada's interests and engagement in the region. Natural resource extraction is an important economic driver in many countries of the Americas, including in Canada. When well managed, natural resource extraction can create economic opportunities, and it can generate important financial resources. But when managed poorly, 
it can cause instability, conflict, and lasting environmental damage. We've heard some of these stories this morning. Responsible natural resource requirement management requires sustainable environmental stewardship, transparent and prudent revenue management, and the active engagement to prevent corruption and human rights abuses. My government strongly supports natural resource management in a responsible way as a means of generating sustainable and inclusive economic benefits from natural resource development. Canadian mining companies play a major role in the region's natural resources sector. As of October 2017, Canadian mining and exploration companies had interests in nearly 800 projects at various stages of development across Latin America and the Caribbean. These investments are generally viewed by host governments as important sources of domestic revenue and as providing direct and indirect employment opportunities. According to reports submitted in 2016 under Canada's Extractive Sector Transparency Measures Act, 102 Canadian headquartered mining and exploration companies contributed over 1.3 billion Canadian dollars to Latin America and Caribbean economies in the form of payment of taxes, royalties, fees, bonuses, and infrastructure improvements. Canadian companies contribute more than royalties, employment, and infrastructure. The vast majority of these companies operate successful projects and engage effectively with local communities. They adapt to local contexts and employ responsible practices to manage risks and build public confidence. Last month, by way of example, a Canadian company working in Ecuador won the UN Global Compact Award for its support of catering Las Peñas. With support from a Canadian company in a two-year period, Catering Las Peñas, CLP for, for short, grew from a small staff providing catering, laundry, and cleaning services to more than 150 employees, largely from the local community, providing services to over 800 people daily. Moreover, they integrated local agricultural producers into their supply chains and subsequently won an additional contract at the local hospital. Not all situations are as successful as this one. The Government of Canada is well aware of reports of conflict as well as allegations of human rights abuses, environmental infractions associated with the presence of Canadian mining companies. In an effort to address these challenges, the Government of Canada engages stakeholders and promotes measures to minimize tension and mitigate conflict before it begins. And I'm pleased to say that many of the organizations across the table from me today are part of these consultations with the Government of Canada, and we're very grateful for their efforts and for their willingness to work with us. Many of our embassies have cultivated a role as a convener, providing space for open and productive dialogue. The Embassy of Canada in Guatemala, for example, established an international group on CSR, business, and human rights that promotes collaboration, information sharing, and joint events with stakeholders. Ambassador Russo has left that post some time ago, and has, there are two ambassadors that have been in place since then. The Mining Working Group of Canada-Mexico Partnership is another example of a forum that brings together government, private sector and civil society representatives to discuss issues such as environmental responsibility in mining and community engagement. The Government of Canada's approach to corporate social responsibility includes two dispute resolution mechanisms. One is the national contact point for the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprise, and the second is the Office of the Extractive Sector Councillor. These dispute resolution mechanisms help to identify opportunities for stakeholders to find mutually acceptable outcomes. They foster and encourage constructive dialogue between companies, communities, and other stakeholders in order to identify and resolve issues before they escalate. In addition, the Government of Canada is reviewing recommendations for the creation of an ombudsperson's office, and to that end, is currently engaging civil society and industry stakeholders to better understand their views. The Government of Canada's overarching objective in reviewing such recommendations is strengthening our approach to corporate accountability abroad. Canada's domestic experience with responsible natural resource development is widely respected and as such often sought out. Governments and other stakeholders frequently ask Canada to provide technical expertise and regulatory and policy advice to support responsible natural resource development in their regions. Canada often responds to such requests with the aim of strengthening host country natural resource governance. For example, the Government of Ecuador and Colombia consulted Canada regarding regulatory frameworks, policies, and best practices related to engagement and consultation with indigenous peoples in mining. The Argentinian parliamentarians sought information on Canadian federal provincial governance of natural resources. And in Peru, Canada provided technical assistance to support the development of a multi-stakeholder roundtable. 
As a result of the work of this roundtable, extractive revenues were reinvested in locally identified needs, including roads, water and sanitation, irrigation, and education. The Government of Canada is also often asked to support the development of local conflict mitigation and recourse mechanisms. In Peru, once again, Canada is working with the Office of the Ombudsperson, responsible for monitoring local location and causes of social conflicts, including those related to mining activities. The work of this office resulted in the development of a law requiring prior consultation with Indigenous peoples on projects and administrative decisions that affect them, including in relation to natural resource extraction. We recognize that strengthening the government's environment is only part of what is needed. The Government of Canada also has an obligation to encourage responsible business practices among Canadian companies operating abroad. As outlined in Canada's Corporate Social Responsibility Strategy, the Government of Canada actively works with Canadian companies and other stakeholders to promote internationally recognized CSR standards and to enhance the ability of companies and communities to apply and enforce these standards. Canada's CSR strategy includes commitments to support multilateral and multi-stakeholder initiatives, including the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights Initiative, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the UN's Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and the OECD Due Diligence Guidance on Responsible Materials, Supplies Chains, and Conflict-Affected and High-Risk Areas. Canada is also a state party to a number of international anti-corruption conventions. These include the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption and the OECD Convention on Combating Bribery of Foreign Public Officials in International Business Transactions, which is enshrined in Canadian law through the Corruption of Foreign Public Officials Act. The Government of Canada encourages Canadian companies to conform to these standards by requiring them to sign an integrity declaration before receiving certain types of advocacy support from government officials. For example, before accompanying businesses to meetings with foreign public officials or making representations to foreign public officials on any company's behalf, these commitments are required. The Integrity Declaration commits the company to engage lawfully, and it requires that company to acknowledge the expectation that it will operate in a manner consistent with the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Canada also works with industry associations to promote best practices. A good example is the work being undertaken with the Mining Association of Canada's Towards Sustainable Mining, or TSM. TSM is a set of tools that helps mining companies to elevate and manage their environmental and social responsibilities. TSM's approach is unique in the world, and the Government of Canada is proud to support its expansion internationally. In the Americas, TSM has been adopted in Argentina and a number of other countries have indicated an interest. TSM has recently been updated to strengthen the language on measures to prevent the use of child and forced labor in mining supply chains, in line with the ILO Conventions 29, 138, and 182. It's unique in its requirement of facility level reporting, which can serve as a catalyst for dialogue and an important tool in the prevention and resolution of social conflicts. The need for responsible business practices also applies to the financing of investments. Canadian mining and exploration companies can access financial support for projects through a variety of sources. One of the primary Canadian sources of finance for work abroad is through EDC. All companies seeking services and support from EDC are subject to the corporation's environment, social risk management and governance frameworks. This framework is based on international agreements and standards, including the OECD's common approaches, the equator principles, and the International Financial Corporation performance standards. EDC aligns its approach with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. All transactions considered by EDC are subject to a risk management framework that evaluates a company's track record, including its corporate environmental and social risk management policies, its commitment to domestic standards, including Canadian and host country standards, and commitments to international environmental and social standards and guidelines. In order to access financing in higher risk countries, EDC follows strict requirements, including international standards be met before financing can be approved. EDC also monitors performance over the life of a loan. Finally, I'd like to speak about our commitments to human rights. The Government of Canada is a strong advocate for human rights, both at home and abroad. 
Canada's recently published guidelines on supporting human rights defenders is part of our effort to support those who speak up for human rights violations and abuses. Our missions abroad regularly raise human rights defender cases with local authorities and discuss protection measures, including requesting updates on investigations. Our missions use the same approach for cases associated with corporate activities, irrespective of the nationality of the company involved. Last June, Canada launched our new Feminist International Assistance Policy. Canada's feminist approach places gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls at the centre of international development efforts. In keeping with this policy, Canada is working to implement a feminist approach to natural resource management. This includes enhancing the protection and promotion of the human rights of women and girls. And I would certainly welcome a review of our existing policies in the context of this new policy. A feminist international assistance policy additionally seeks to address the structural barriers that impede women and girls and other marginalized groups from equally contributing to and benefiting from sustainable natural resource management. We are also very mindful of the potential impact of natural resource extraction on indigenous communities. The concepts surrounding free, prior, and informed consent are a key component of Canada's approach to promoting responsible business abroad, particularly in the context of exploration and mining activities. FPIC is about meaningful engagement and partnership with Indigenous peoples on issues of concern and with an aim of achieving consensus. In closing, let me reiterate that respect for human rights is fundamental to Canada's trade, development and foreign policy objectives. The Government of Canada expects Canadian companies operating abroad to respect human rights and all applicable laws to operate transparently and in consultation with host governments and local communities, and to work in a socially and environmentally responsible manner. We know there's still work to do. We are continually assessing our CSR approach with a view to identifying ways to strengthen it, and we are certainly open to your input. We are listening to stakeholders, including local communities, civil society organizations, and companies operating abroad. We are taking into consideration the recommendations of the recent visit of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. The Government of Canada is committed to encouraging the implementation of responsible business practices that contributes to the well-being of people around the world. And once again, I sincerely thank the Canadian activists, researchers that are here today and that continue to bring this issue forward, not just to the Government of Canada, but globally. This is a problem that no single country can solve alone, but that requires a global flame framework and strong cooperation. Thanks to the commissioners for listening today. Muchas gracias, eh, comisionado Cavallaro. Muchas gracias, señor uh, presidente. Uh, let me by thank uh, both uh, parties for uh, thoughtful and, and uh, detailed uh, presentations. Uh, and let me say that I certainly I think the commission welcomes Canada's feminist international assistance policy. Uh, we welcome uh, steps towards creating an ombudsperson for oversight of the mining industry. Uh, that said, let me see if I can uh, drill down on, on a few of the issues raised by the petitioners. And in particular, what strikes me as an issue of uh, a legal framework that is promoting the right standards, uh, that is seeking to encourage, it seems, uh, Canadian mining uh, corporations to engage in a thoughtful, feminist, uh, and rights-respecting way, uh, but perhaps a gulf between uh, that desire and the ability to hold uh, the, the, the feet to the fire of uh, the mining corporations. And there, if I could just raise a couple of the points. Uh, first, uh, Canadian courts, which are transparent and rights-based and excellent by pretty much all international standards, why wouldn't the Canadian government do everything possible to ensure uh, that those who suffer abuses or might suffer abuses uh, with some relation to Canadian mining corporations' involvement, why would it not want them to have access? That just strikes me as a very simple fix. Eliminate as one of the six points which I was curious to hear because I hope to achieve some sort of consensus and steps forward on these six points. That seems to be one. I'd love to hear the <coughs> position of, of Canada on that. Uh, second, the ombudsperson. There are a lot of bodies. I, I won't speak well or ill of other ombuds uh, persons in other institutions. Not my role. 
Uh, but I think the key is to move beyond making recommendations and having those recommendations be mandatory and having some consequence from the recommendations. Uh, is that part of uh, the plan for Canada? Will the ombudsperson be able to say, we found uh, that the killing of a 16-year-old of, of uh, uh, Topacio in, 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 in San Rafael at uh, Las Flores in Guatemala is connected and, we, and therefore there can be no more funding. Which takes me to the issue of uh, the EDC and the, the quite essential role over a billion, something like a billion and a half Canadian dollars that's spent, that goes into the mining sector. It, it strikes me that that's the first place and the easiest place where conditionality on funds uh, can be done in a rigorous fashion. In, uh, in other ways, with courts, there's process, there's time, there's years, but this is Canada as Canada giving money to corporations. There's, there's the, there's the uh, Puerto Gaitan case in Colombia that has been raised where an additional 250 to 500 million dollars was dispersed uh, despite serious uh, uh, labor complaints in the Eco uh, Petrol Eco and, and Canadian partners. So I would love to see, uh, you know, there's six concrete recommendations. How can greater guarantees be implemented? Uh, you know, the, the, the simple term is the carrot and the stick. I think it's, it strikes me that Canada is doing well with the carrot. Uh, I'd love to see uh, the stick, uh, you know, be, be, be made available, be more robust, be more engaged. And if you could speak to uh, steps, concrete steps to be taken with the ombudsperson, with the EDC, uh, with access to Canadian courts and other measures that would provide uh, a bit more of a, let's say, a deterrent from uh, some of the really worrisome behavior that we've heard about uh, with possible connections to Canadian mining. Thank you so much, Mr. President and Madam Gracias, Ambassador. James. Eh, yo voy a, en verdad, eh, complementar algunas de las preguntas o reflexiones que ya realizó el comisionado Cavallaro y tengo también el pedido de nuestra Relatoría Especial para Derechos Económicos, Sociales y Culturales y Ambientales de formular algunas preguntas que en verdad coinciden bastante con los temas que ha tocado ya el comisionado Cavallaro, aunque haré las puntualizaciones del caso. Eh, por ejemplo, una, la primera de ellas se plantea sobre qué acciones específicas de prevención y debida diligencia eh, se, para propiciar el marco respeto a los derechos humanos viene tomando en cuenta Canadá por ejemplo, eh, en, es, en este programa Sport Development Canadá, respecto a industrias extractivas y la inversión de fondos públicos en ella. Ya la señora embajadora ha respondido un poco algo de esto, eh, por lo cual casi yo le preguntaría, un poco siguiendo lo último que dijo James, eh, y si no está la información ahora aquí disponible, sería bueno recibirla por escrito, porque son reiteradas ya en este foro y en nuestros informes, estas denuncias eh, por parte de, de violaciones a derechos en, en diversos países de América Latina por parte de eh, empresas extractivas mineras, especialmente canadienses. Entonces yo le preguntaría, habiendo esta firma de compromiso, estas exigencias, sería bueno conocer eh, cuál es la instancia especializada que realice este seguimiento y qué casos concretos, como digo, si no se tienen acá, que supongo que no necesariamente, pero sí nos interesaría recibir por escrito, ¿qué casos concretos pueden señalarse de sanciones o de exclusión por parte del Estado canadiense respecto a algún tipo de empresas involucradas o denunciadas en este tipo de violaciones? ¿no? Para que la firma de compromisos no sea simplemente un acto ritual, formal, una condición para recibir un financiamiento, pero o que nadie fiscaliza con rigor o que a nadie se sanciona por incumplir su palabra. Creo que sería muy importante conocer aspectos puntuales de ellos y también qué mecanismo de acceso a la información y monitoreo se dan en este tipo de campo. También, dice nuestra relatoría, eh, cuál es la situación actual, el avance en la aprobación, adopción de este ombudsperson, ombudsman, en materia de estos derechos, qué competencias tendría en esta materia, qué coordinaciones se hacen respecto o con la sociedad civil. Yo, como relator de pueblos indígenas, haría dos o tres comentarios que están en la misma línea. Eh, 
Me gustaría saber, puede ser un poco ingenua la pregunta, pero si estas conductas eh, denunciadas de empresas canadienses en América Latina también se repiten dentro de su país. Es decir, ¿hay de parte de estas empresas digamos un doble rasero, una doble moral, es decir, en su país se portan bien, pero cuando van a otros países no, o es que en los dos lados se portan mal. Eh, eh, porque a mí muchas veces al tocar estos temas en algunos foros empresariales, mineros, que se les paran los pelos y se escandalizan, eh, bueno, eh, a veces dicen, bueno, pero nosotros cumplimos con la legislación y nuestro país, entonces me gustaría saber si este tipo de estándares que venimos conversando son exigidos y cumplidos también dentro del país en las actividades de estas empresas. La Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos ha dicho con claridad que en defensa del derecho de propiedad sobre las tierras y territorios de los pueblos indígenas y la profunda vinculación que existe en esta relación del pueblo indígena con tierra y con la cultura y la subsistencia de su forma de vida como pueblo, eh, incluso los estados que no han ratificado el convenio 169 de las eh, OIT, por el respeto al derecho de propiedad colectiva indígena de la tierra que está en la convención, esos estados y esas empresas tienen también que adoptar la obligación de aplicar el derecho a la consulta. Eh, algo de consulta hemos estado hablando en la audiencia anterior, pero me gustaría conocer cuál es la posición oficial del Estado de Canadá respecto a la aplicación del derecho a la consulta respecto a pueblos indígenas en actividades mineras o extractivas dentro de Canadá y fuera de Canadá. Por último, el tema del acceso a la justicia, eh, en este caso nacional de Canadá. Sí, nuestro informe, por ejemplo, de industrias extractivas plantea lo importante que es eh, una responsabilidad internacional del Estado por las vulneraciones a los derechos humanos que puedan realizar empresas de su nacionalidad fuera del territorio del país, lo cual supone la posibilidad de demandarlas no solo en Canadá, sino de involucrar también al Estado por su inacción. Entonces, honestamente no va a ser fácil para muchas empresas, pero sí para muchas personas, pueblos indígenas, acceder a la justicia canadiense, aunque con el apoyo de organizaciones especializadas de la sociedad civil ello puede ser más factible, ya se ha dicho acá, se ha preguntado sobre barreras o límites para ello, el ideal sería que estas violaciones fueran, en primer lugar, que no se dieran, y que si se dieran, fueran sancionadas en los propios países donde se lo producen, pero eso requiere poderes judiciales firmes, independientes, comprometidos con los derechos humanos, tribunales que a veces ceden a tentaciones de corrupción por el poder económico o presiones políticas también. Entonces sí sería importante conocer eh, la postura, ya la señora embajadora lo ha dicho, pero eh, casos concretos, por ejemplo, donde el Estado puede haber marcado distancia en su política oficial respecto a la conducta de empresas que han vulnerado derechos, por ejemplo, de pueblos indígenas o derechos ambientales fuera del de territorio canadiense. Eh, algún eh, ya, Entonces, el comisionado Vargas y luego el, nuestro relator especial para la libertad de expresión, Edison Lanza. Sí, presidente, muchas gracias. Este es un tema muy complejo, tan complejo como el de la corrupción. Eh, la tensión de derechos permanentes que se da entre el desarrollo o entre la explotación de recursos y la protección ambiental. Eso siempre está generando tensiones, pero llama mucho la atención que se hayan presentado varias muertes, varias eh, violaciones de derechos, siempre los están denunciando los activistas en, en tratándose de estas explotaciones por parte de las grandes empresas. A mí me gustaría primero saber en qué va la investigación de la muerte de Topacio. ¿Qué ha sucedido con eso y qué ha ocurrido en otros países donde se ha denunciado el, eh, la muerte eh, violenta de activistas eh, que están siempre proclamando la defensa del ambiente? Y eh, celebro desde luego eh, buenas prácticas como las que anuncia la señora embajadora, la creación del defensor el hecho de que realmente se procure hasta donde sea posible eh, proteger el ambiente en los sitios donde eh, 
reciben la licencia de explotación correspondiente, eh, pero obviamente que hay que seguir refinando mucho la actividad. Por supuesto que en países como los nuestros hay eh, explotación de recursos de carácter ilegal y eso es muchísimo peor que cualquiera eh, y, y sería ideal que pudiéramos algún día desterrar esta clase de prácticas, pero también hay una gran cantidad de recursos, de, de personas humanas que viven de esto, que, que también merecen algún grado de protección y por eso hablo yo de tensiones permanentes de derecho. Entonces me agradaría eh, muchísimo saber qué se sabe, de, de, eh, saber qué, qué ha pasado con las investigaciones y mm, el hecho de que las buenas prácticas que anuncia la señora embajadora, ojalá y se sigan incrementando, sean muchísimo más eh, cumplidas en cada uno de los países donde han recibido las licencias de explotación. Eso. Buenos días a todas y a todos. Eh, voy a ir rápido con algunas preguntas puntuales. Eh, parece bien interesante esta experiencia del defensor Ombudsman eh, respecto a estos emprendimientos y proyectos. La pregunta es, siempre pensamos en la independencia y autonomía de los Ombudsman cuando hay que defender su independencia del Estado. Pero en este caso hay un componente, obviamente, de recursos muy fuertes de esta industria. Entonces, ¿cuáles son, son las garantías que este, normativas y, y de designación y demás que, que se están previendo para mantener la autonomía de este eh, Ombudsman. Eh, en segundo lugar, eh, advierto que como no, varios temas de los que se han mencionado por parte de los comisionados, en materia de acceso a la información y consulta previa, hay también un, un gap entre eh, las prácticas canadienses y las prácticas de los países involucrados en, estas, en este tipo de emprendimiento, digo los gobiernos latinoamericanos. Entonces la pregunta sería, ¿cómo podemos avanzar en que todos asuman las mismas prácticas? ¿Y qué podría hacer la comisión? ¿Qué sugerencia tienen ustedes? Eh, incluso con el Estado de Canadá, que por suerte formamos parte de todos del mismo hemisferio, para que estas prácticas de, de acceso a la información en materia de industria extractiva y consulta previa eh, se consoliden en la región, porque realmente estamos muy rezagados en muchos de nuestros países. Y, y en tercer lugar, este, respecto también a, a, la, a la protesta, esta, este, la comisión estuvo y a mí me tocó participar de, de la visita a Guatemala y estuvimos en varios eh, pueblos y uno, claro, observa como en un, en un pueblo indígena, eh, básicamente de mayoría indígena, donde viven de, de, de la tierra y su contacto con los cultivos y todo lo demás, se incorpora allí un monstruo que es o una represa o un, y realmente uno lo ve veníamos en helicóptero y dice ¿cómo no se, no se arbitraron medidas para, este digamos en el, matizar este, el, el impacto que tiene esto, ¿no? en, en, y muchas veces sienten que no reciben nada de esa industria que se puso allí a unos pocos eh, metros de, de, de su comunidad, ¿no? eh, y ahí surge el problema de la protesta y la represión y demás, entonces también cómo podríamos eh, desde el sistema interamericano este, contribuir para que obviamente estas leg protestas legítimas que muchas veces se levantan este, no terminen además en tragedias y en, en la pérdida de, de vidas y en la en el abuso del uso de la fuerza, ¿no? que muchas veces también est están involucradas las empresas porque utilizan o contratan servicios de, de contratistas privados para, para la vigilancia de sus predios y esto genera un impacto también este, en, en la protesta. Muchas gracias, eh, son bastantes preguntas, eh, algunas, algún, eh, algunas podrán comentarse y responderse aquí, otras estaremos atentos a recibirlas luego por escrito. Eh, le daría la palabra a cada una de las partes hasta por siete minutos. Thank you, commissioners. Um, the recommendation to create an ombudsperson has been a long-standing recommendation to Canada, as the ambassador herself is aware and was involved in a process 10 years ago that reached a consensus between industry and civil society for an ombudsperson. We are still waiting for the creation of such an office. The abuses, the killings, the human rights violations that have been reported today, most of them occurred while the two existing mechanisms that the government cited were in existence. Canada's current corporate social responsibility strategy has been a failure. And I think this, this uh, pattern of killings and human rights violations is, uh, uh, is the evidence that the current uh, approach is failing. 
independence will be an essential element for an ombudsperson office. I'm very glad the um, Special Rapporteur raised that uh, question. Uh, both independence from political interference by the Canadian government and by interference from business interests. So we should be vigilant on that and recommendations in that regard would be most welcome uh, to Canada. I also wanted to emphasize the importance of access to Canadian courts in the ombudsperson carrying out his or her mandate. Knowing that you could end up in court will give a great deal of more weight and, uh, and uh, encouragement uh, to actually follow through and implement recommendations from an ombudsperson. So I think that these two, the non-judicial and the judicial, are connected and we need both in Canada. And in the past two years with the new government, we've seen no policy change and no law change on, on any of these issues. Thank you. Um, the case of Topacio Reynoso repeat remains in complete impunity and I think you know Guatemala has a rate of impunity for crimes committed I think at 93 percent and I think that kind of puts the operations of projects like Tahoe Resources at project in a larger context of corruption where you know the former president of Guatemala vice president and the the Minister of Energy and Mines who granted this mining license are either in jail or on the run right now and I think you know it kind of, ex in that wider context of how these individual cases of people who oppose the installation of the project, even before it's in place, how these licenses are granted, and then um, how they continue to push by silencing opposition, kind of put that framework in place of corruption in, in Guatemala. I'd just like to point out uh, that Canada's representatives uh, mentioned that um, the vast majority of projects are carried out responsibly and without conflict. I just want to point out that to our knowledge, neither industry nor government have carried out the systematic monitoring of violence and human rights abuse associated with Canadian mining in Latin America. So um, I believe that the, their observations on the state of violence and, and human rights in that sector are, are largely anecdotal. Um, if violence and human rights abuse is an exception, it is a very serious one. It's morally reprehensible, it's destructive to society, it's destructive to our relationship with Latin America. Um, so uh, if it's an exception, it, that's no excuse to, to, to not regulate. We need a robust legal framework to regulate Canadian mining in Latin America with the economic self-determination of communities, indigenous communities, campesino communities, uh, Afro-descendant communities at its core. Thank you. To finalize, well, first of all, thank you to Madam Ambassador for the, for, the, for the presentation and thank you to the members of the Commission Special Rapporteur. We will submit additional information in writing to highlight some of the issues that we are going to address. I would just like to focus on two issues. Uh, Madam Ambassador has been very kind in presenting the standards, international standards by EDC. She just, I think that she forgot one word, secret. There are secret international standards because Article 24.3 of the EDC Act clearly states, it states that all information regarding business transactions are confidential. So there is no way for us to understand or know the human right, the social impact assessment, environmental social impact assessment. So these are important issues, as, as Commissioner Cavallaro mentioned, that is an easy fix. Make significant information of EDC publicly available to everybody. And in a way, that is a segue to uh, Rapporteur Lanza's comment on how to prevent this. And we go back again to the issue of EDC. Many of the cor corporations that are seeking EDC finding are junior companies. They, they need and the, their financial venture depends on relies on EDC finances. And that is the key where you can actually adopt binding mechanisms to assure, but also to per periodically review the conduct of Canadian mining companies. So that is why either even as a concluding statement, even though there is a possibility that we will have an ombudsperson in Canada, we should not miss the picture. We need legally binding framework to address home state responsibility and home state obligations. Finally, I'd like to thank the Inter-American Commission for this hearing. Uh, we acknowledge the step that has been taken by the Commission to address home state's responsibility, specifically regarding Canada. 
uh, would like to uh, demand the Inter-American Commission to keep using its mechanisms such as press release, Article 18 of its statute, to warn uh, situations in which Canada is also a key player in situations of serious human rights violations such, such as those described here in this hearing. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Ahora la intervención del Estado. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me let me say yes, uh, and you're absolutely right. I, I was involved in the process, the National Roundtables on Corporate Social Responsibility 10 years ago. It was a very eye-opening process, and it was innovative in that it involved industry associations, the private sector, civil society, as well as affected communities, and a range of government departments. And there were two levels of, of involvement. We had public hearings, and we also had um, in-camera sessions, closed-door sessions, with really frank exchanges. And certainly I came out of that process understanding that what we need to do is be partners in a process to create what Canada wants to be, which is a good international player in this particular industry. We're already economically a, a huge player, but I think the responsibility to be a good player is that much more important as a result of that. And while you're quite right, there's no systematic monitoring of human rights abuses. We say that most Canadian mining uh, operations operate well because the, the thing that we do know is the economic impact that they provide. And to a large degree, there's a lot of good that's done. The difficulty is how do you address the intolerable incident of even one story like the one that we've heard this morning against the, the good that you get from the economic investment? It's, it's not, um, you cannot compare those two things. None of them are acceptable. We need an industry that protects people, that provides equal benefits, that creates healthy, sustainable communities, and that's controlled by the governments wherein they operate, but on a basis that meets an international standard that we all agree to. And I think that's where we find some of the challenges here. Also, I want to say, too, I need to clarify this, and I'm glad that Ian did. We do not have an ombudsman in Canada. We are working towards the establishment of one. And I personally have been working towards the establishment of one for some time. We have a counselor. Um, that office is under review. The idea that was originally put forward by the advisory group at the National Roundtables is being reconsidered, and, and I hope that we'll get something good out of that. Um, that is not to say that the things that the government of Canada has done to date are not good. They, they are. Canada is an industry leader worldwide. We have a lot more that we could do to improve that, but the conversation is not over, and I think it depends on the involvement of these organizations. There's also a gap uh, internationally and globally in terms of law. The challenge that exists, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to go into this uh, anywhere, I probably are too far into it, but the domestic law versus the law that applies in the country where the mine is in operation, and how do you connect the pieces? The idea that, that uh, Commissioner Caballero put forward of access to Canadian courts, that's something that needs to be looked at. It's not a simple thing, uh, but it's something that was under discussion 10 years ago uh, when we did uh, the National Roundtable. Um, I also liked the comment that was made about where's the stick. Um, Canadians are not, if I may say, stick people. Um, the, the way to get up, get about this, <laughs> the way to get at this is to find a good environment. Is to is to try to seek um, outcomes that are win-win. Um, this should not be a punitive approach. Uh, partly because we want to make sure that that balance between the good that's done and the and the harm that's done is addressed in an appropriate way. We don't want um, by, by trying to address the harm to affect the good, which has a broad and, and important applicability in the Americas. Um, I guess at the end of the day, my main comment is this. The government of, of Canada's intention is to be a good player in a good, solid international industry that can generate a, a lot of, of um, prosperity worldwide. We don't have that yet. That doesn't exist. Canada needs partnerships with other governments. We need partnerships with civil society, with academics, with researchers, with communities to achieve that. I'd, I'd like to say that the Government of Canada is on that path. Um, and what some of what we've brought to the table today are the things that we've put in place so far. Um, again, we're not a single actor in this industry and we can't affect the global dynamic by ourselves. We need to do this together. Um, as far as the specific questions you asked about the applicability of FPIC domestically and internationally, I would say that the roundtable process specifically addressed Canadian extractive operations overseas partly because of the tremendous difference in, in applicability and the, tremendous, and, the, and the context issues around the domestic environment. Um, that's something that's on the table. Um, 
we will get back to you on the applicability of FPIC domestically and internationally and ensuring that there's a consistency there. And then the questions as well, I know that my colleagues, Mayor Jose um, and Eugenie, have taken careful notes. So we will get back to you with specific answers on EDC. The transparency issue, Canada is a member of the EITI, but it would be interesting to take a look at uh, EDC and how that applies in that case. But again, genuinely from the bottom of my heart, I do thank you for being here this morning. I thank you for staying on this issue. We absolutely need to be looking at this rigorously and we need to hold the government of Canada to the highest standard because that's what we expect of it. It's our intention to be that player and we certainly count on, on your help to get the rest of the global community involved as well. So thank you once again to the commissioners. Thank you for your questions. We will get back to you in, uh, in writing with some specific answers. And nice to see you here, uh, Rapporteur. Muchas gracias. Entonces estaremos muy interesados en dar seguimiento a este tema y recibir esa información. Eh, concluimos esta audiencia y aproximadamente en 10 minutos iniciaremos la próxima. Gracias.